Hello, folks. Uh, we're back again today, and we're very excited to be here. We've got uh, myself, Garrett French. We've got Eric Ward and Sherry Thoreau. We're going to be talking to you today about site navigation and how it relates to link-worthy content. Um, Sherry, uh, can you walk us through the table of contents? Can anybody sure. hear me? Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't know. I can hear good. you. Good. I wasn't sure. I was like, is my mind mute? Um, yeah, Sherry, yeah, please walk us through. What, what are we talking about? What's our overview for today? Well, first of all, we're going to introduce ourselves. We'll just do some quick, quick introductions because um, some of you might, might not have ever met us, so I'm more than happy to introduce ourselves. Uh, we're going to overview um, some really, really important course concepts and establish a common vocabulary because in order for us to have effective communication, we need to use a common vocabulary. So we'll show you some terms and definitions that we commonly use in site navigation, information architecture, and link development. And then we're going to go over the what, where, why, who, and whens and hows of digital content assets. And at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. So um, the goals. Like I said, what what is a digital content asset? Who do we create for them for and why do we create them? Where do we place them and where do we place them on a website? And um, I love uh, Eric, Eric Ward's uh, comment that one of the goals of link building is to reduce the friction of people trying to accomplish their goals on your website. So. As we go through this, we're also going to tell you how to really enhance the user experience. So, folks, um, I'm, Sherry, I'm going to interrupt you because I'm so excited about this webinar today. It's because this is an area of discussion that is so painfully needed in yeah. the SEO and, and marketing space. So, so often we'll start a project on the age on citation on the citation lab side. We'll start an agency project, and we're just bolting on content. We are just kind of throwing it up willy-nilly, and, and it's almost an afterthought. It's often an afterthought, and, and this is putting <laughs> – it's, it's a crazy idea, but putting the thought first is, is – it's just really astounding and exciting to be able to work. Uh, Eric and I have had a blast working with Sherry and learning from Sherry. This is a killer webinar. So, okay. Um, I'm so and, and, and so we have some little things, little symbols for you. Anytime you see the green with the check mark, means this is a good idea. Do what this website did. We love it. You see the the white X in red. Don't do that. Bad idea. Woe to you if you've done it. And anytime you see an exclamation point, it's really important and it's critical for you to remember it. So. Um, here are our introductions. This is Garrett French, and for those of you who don't know, Garrett French and I met because when he wa uh, worked at Web, Web Pro News, he was my editor. I got to be your editor. It, it was it was a, a hum. A, a, she, she she Sherry tells this story all the time, but I I don't think I did that much. But, there, but um, it was it was uh, it was that's that is where we met. Two thousand two, maybe um, way back when. So, um, so go ahead and tell people oh, yeah. who don't know yeah. you what, who you are and what you do. Folks, I, I run the Citation Labs agency, um, do everything from uh, tool design, do um, uh, strategy design, have the link prospector tool, the broken link builder tool, uh, co-citation tool, and with Eric wrote the ultimate guide to link building, and I write for search engine land. Um, as often as I'm able and get to work with incredible folks like Eric and Sherry uh, doing webinars like this. Um, who, who, I think Eric's next in, yep. the, in this sequence. Yeah, Mr. Ward. Um, this is, okay, so Eric is a mentor of mine, like Sherry. Um, Eric was an unknowing mentor. Eric, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself in just a second. Um, but he, so, so he, I remember the day when I actually was reading search in, search marketing standard. I don't know if anybody remembers this print publication, but Eric had an article in there and had some incredible ideas. And where I just he unlocked uh, advanced operator prospecting for me. Eric is absolutely hands down my my 
link building mentor. Eric, go ahead and introduce yourself, though. Man, I appreciate that that you uh, you said that. that um, Somebody I wore, at least besides well, your I, mom, you know, it's like. I, I, I work alone in a little office above a garage for 20 years at the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, so it's not like I get a whole lot of. It's not it, it, where where I live is not exactly a hotbed of internet activity, you know. Um, you know, so but so. Charles uh, Benapier uh, is his neighbor. <laughs> but I, but uh, and she's a famous librarian, and actually the only re and the reason I have this company is because uh, in grad school I took her class, and the grade in her class it was entrepreneur entrepreneurship in the information profession and your goal and your grade was based upon coming up with a fictitious business that in some way was involved in the information industry now this is 1993 so uh, because the web fascinated me and was just starting then I mean the web was still text based it was links which is the fir very first text based web browser that was actually written by Tim Berners Lee who wrote the hypertext protocol but anyway long story short my business came about because I had to create a fictitious business for a grade and then about halfway through that process I started <laughs> thinking you know this actually might work Right. So I went to a local ISP. <laughs> yeah, I went to an ISP in Knoxville and said, "This is what I think of my idea. It's like when these websites launch, nobody knows they exist. They're just on a hard drive somewhere. Like, who makes sure they get listed at Yahoo? Who makes sure they get submitted to Infoseek and Lycos and Webcrawler and Hotbot and Lycos top five percent and all of these ancient places where you used to go to get publicity for your websites back then?" And that ISP said, "Well, we don't have anybody that does that. And if you'll do that, we'll pay you to do it." And that was for me when I realized, "Oh my." gosh, this is actually potentially legit. So 20 years later, um, you can kind of see from the bullet points, I don't, I, it embarrasses me to read these simply because all the, the subtext of all of them means, man, this guy's old. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'm not. That picture on the, that you see up there is just seven years ago, so I'm really not as old as you think. Um, but uh, uh, um, I don't even want to say what my background is because actually I've got a new bullet point for Sherry, and this is actually not a lie. I have analyzed roughly... 16 million URLs over the course of my career. I, I did the math of all of the projects and all of the backlink analytics and the Excel wow. spreadsheets, which I still have. I've analyzed 16 million URLs by hand over the course of 20 <laughs> of, of the course of 21 years, and um, and my and, and my metrics for my analysis of the quality of those URLs is what I call my gut. My algorithm is in my gut. It's what comes from actually looking at that many pages over this many years. So I'm not even going to say anything more about my background other than to say I publish a newsletter that will help you do better on the web than yes. you're currently doing. Yeah. Uh, and I still, for a handful of clients, actually do do a little bit of outreach. But for the most part, I develop strategies, create backlink uh, blueprints, and help companies basically get the maximum out of their website that they had hoped to when they got on this amazing thing called the web. So I'm just happy to be here. And, uh, so about uh, that newsletter? Continue. Like, yeah, I would I would have asked you for a discount on it, but it's only eight dollars a month, so I just well, I decided get, not to. It's well, it's can, it, and it's it's you know it's an incredible, insane bargain at eight dollars a month. It's well, it's going to fifteen next year. <laughs> it's going to be grandfathered in. If you if I you're in at eight bucks, you, yeah, if you're in at eight bucks, you keep it at eight bucks. But I've had so many people tell me, man, raise the price on that, especially as I've started to add videos and webinars and other things in there. They're like, nobody's going to think it's worth it at eight bucks. You need to raise the price. So I probably yeah. will do that next year. But anyway, that's a, a whole side story. Um, me, I'm excited me, to do this webinar uh, uh, with you guys yeah. simply because I think both of you all, in fact, the three of us need to start a company because we each come at this from three different areas of expertise yep. and there are people uh, and that's something we need to talk about after this webinar because I think uh, I, I think Sherry Garrett and Eric Inc needs to happen let me talk about Sherry for a minute and why I was so excited so this is her brainchild this webinar and this this meeting of the minds is a is, a, is her brainchild um, she saw that there was a, a, a gap between the folks dreaming up like Eric and I in our, in our uh, garages and attics, um, dreaming up uh, linkable assets, and um, and then the gap is between that asset and actual usability and site utility. Um, Sherry is uh, just a, a, a master of site usability and navigation. Um, I've known her for. Uh, close on to 15 years now. I uh, actually got to meet her in real life at a conference years ago, and, and I'm absolutely um, uh, just a, a, um, a student of Sherry's every day, and she's, she's 
been blowing my mind since we started discussions like two or three months ago on this project. But um, Sherry, would you talk a little bit, tell, tell, tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yes, um, and any of you who have been um, on Twitter have learned that Eric Ward is my uh, professor. He is, has been teaching me how to be a badass. And um, apparently, I'm doing a good job being his student. So I thank you for that, Eric. Um, Sherry is what I would call a rare breed. Um, I have a background in medical genetics and Asian studies, particularly Japan and Asian religions. But And my PhD work is actually in human and computer interaction. So I look at things from a technical perspective as well as a very human perspective. And search it is right in there. Search is something that you have to understand humans as well as understanding technology. And I love that Eric mentioned um, all those uh, search engines. And there's a reason also I'm glad Eric mentioned um, he's been doing this for 21 years, and I've been doing this for 20 years, is that link development was an online marketing strategy long before Google came into existence. And a lot of things that Eric and I were doing back in 1994 and 1995 still apply. And we are going to show you some of those principles today, and I hope you get a lot out of what we're going to talk about. So. Let's start with something simple and a concept that we all have possibly encountered, and that's riding an elevator. How many of you have all ridden in an elevator? I've ridden in an elevator. Okay. I have too. And um, I'm going to tell you something interesting is that the elevators that you're about to see are elevators that I were I was actually in the day my niece, Metallica, was born on New Year's Day. Her name is Metallica. We call her Tally. And I love that I have a niece named Metallica. So here is a genuine scenario because um, Eric Garrett and I all go, tend to go to conferences. So we're in this hotel to attend a conference. Garrett's on the 10th floor. Eric's on the 15th floor. I'm on the 12th floor. And um, as I've had a knee replacement, um, whenever I go to a hotel, one of the first things I do is get to the gym to exercise my knee and make sure it's nice and flexible. And it is true, my metal knee is named Larry, and the other metal knee that I'm eventually going to get is going to be named Mo. So, How about I, don't want to, I don't want to ask what you're going to name Curly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, now, we all now have a first... Live occurrence of Eric teaching me to be a badass. Sorry, Isn't sorry. that great? He's, his timing is impeccable. I'm not telling you who I'm naming Curly. Okay. So let's go back to the elevator. All okay. of us have to do something. I need to go work out because Larry is all stiff. Uh, Eric needs to share the thumb drive to prepare questions for the event because at all these conferences, believe me, People walk up to Eric and ask him questions. And um, Garrett and I also have something in common. We accidentally leave our glasses in our car. So how do we get to the workout room? How do we get our thumbnail drive? And how do we get, get to our car? We get in an elevator. So we know that this hotel is at least 16 places where they can place content assets, like a, such as an elevator not an elevator, such as a workout room, and let's see how the hotel might handle some of these content assets and the navigation to the different places. So these are the tasks that we three have to do. So here's the elevator. Let's say we need to go to the seventh floor. I'm going to ask Eric, what do you expect to see? Let's say you press the number seven. What do you expect to see when the doors open? Unless I have some other secondary navigation in the form of signage in that elevator, my hunch is that the only things I'm going to see on the seventh floor of any hotel are going to be signs that tell me which rooms are where and then a sign that tells me where the ice machine is. Okay, exactly. This is pretty normal. Do you expect to hear anything? No. Well, I might hear seventh floor. Or? 
ding, um, ding or exactly. Ding. Mm -hmm. um, visually, this the word the number seven might light up. And if there and maybe a TV screen showing CNN rather than something actually helpful. Ex ex exactly. Okay, so that's our mental model. When we an elevator door opens, we expect to see some kind of image or hear some kind of sound that tells us where we're going and have we arrived. So that's pressing the number seven. So let's say um, we need to go to the lobby because um, we need to ask the concierge where the conference is being held. Garrett, how, what would you do and what would you expect to see after pressing the letter L? I would press the button. I would expect the button to light up. Um, I would expect the elevator to descend and a ding and open up onto the lobby. Um, well, I would hope it would be the lobby. Sometimes those elevators are way far away from the lobby. So I might have to look for a lobby sign is probably what I would expect to, to look for. Unless it was, you know, the elevator was close to the lobby and then I would expect to see the lobby. Okay. Would, do you, if the, you open the door and you saw this, would you think you were in the lobby? Yes, I would. Okay. That is pretty much what everybody expects. Okay. Now, here is a different elevator. What button would you press to go to the lobby? <laughs> this is, wait, is this a uh, elevator from uh, where, where English is the, the first language of the country? This is an elevator from the United States. Whoa. And you uh, need to go to the lobby because you want some coffee. I'm going to have to take a, Garrett, I'm going to have to take a, a wild guess and say G meaning ground, like ground floor, because I'm assuming a lobby is typically on the ground floor. I don't, I mean, I'm going to have to take a guess at it. G okay. meaning guess, basically. B would be basement, right? So maybe a atrium? Atrium? Is that a thing in, in hotels? Or R for rotunda? That's the thing. It's like, in other words, I'm not sure. Exactly. And if you were in Europe, the B would be the lobby, but this is the United States. Okay, so the task is to go to the lobby, um, thumb drive, get some coffee. What would happen if the door is opened and you saw this? I'm not in the lobby. Or it's a minimalist lobby. Maybe. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I'd and, also, um, I'd, yeah, I'd also realize that they did a poor job of promoting this conference because nobody showed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, this happens all the time in elevators, and this elevator, ironically, um, I took the braille off, but uh, when I did this uh, usability test in this elevator, uh, there was a person who actually read braille and told me. The, even the braille was wrong on this elevator, but most uh. people um, pressed G in the United States, and they were wrong. And what do you think this happens? What? When do you think this happens on the web? Well, it happens all the time. Um, so this elevator, boo, bad information sent. Um, now let's go back to the elevator where you have to go to hotel parking. Oh what, man, it could be it could be anywhere. I've been to hotels where the parking was up top. I've been to hotels where it was in the middle, where it was in the basement. Uh, so if I'm presented with that, um, I, I can. Uh, my assumption is going to be there's no way it's on a numeric floor, so I'm going to press L. Right, exactly, and that's the lobby, and we've already seen that. So this isn't a very good elevator panel. So what do we know about? this particular hotel. And by the way, these two elevator panels were in the elevators right next to each other. Is this related to what you call information sent? Yes. So w what happened to with these elevators is the scenario was very clear. I need to go to the lobby. I need to go to the seventh floor. I need to go to the parking garage. I need to go somewhere and I lost the information sent. And if you lose information sent, you probably lose customers. So here is an example of information sent. Number one, people typing keywords into a search engine. Number two, search engines present search results hopefully validating your information sent. If I clicked on the top link here, I expect to go to the cancer.gov homepage. 
All right, here's something we did at the previous webinar. It's called an expectancy test. It's a really good usability test that everybody can do, and I'll show you how to do it right now. Basically, you present a person in a usability test, you do one person at a time, and you ask them, what do you expect to see when you click on this link? And you don't show them the answer because everybody says, oh yeah, I expected to see that. Well, just so you know, if they expected to see it, they would have told you. What we're looking for is the user mental model. So I'm going to click lung cancer. Um, Garrett and Eric, what do you expect to see when you click on lung cancer? Um, my expectation is to confirm that I'm in the right place after clicking that, I want to first of all see the words lung cancer, and I don't mean in the title tag up in the tab. I want to see the, just, just as though at the top of your image number three there, I see National Cancer Institute in red. My hope is when I click lung cancer that I'm going to immediately be shown that I have arrived at the right place because I'm going to see something that says the words lung cancer and then the subset of information will be like it says there, information about lung cancer, treatment, prevention, and causes. Yes. Okay, so those words are the information sent. What if you got this page? <laughs> I would assume that the poor guy who's the webmaster died of lung cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Very I'm good. I'm sorry. I, I'm so, gonna, you understand, so I, I'm trying I'm to sorry. prove a point here. That's exactly what happens in, in the elevators when you don't have a good site navigation this and a good a labeling system. Is you, is you just, lose people. The yeah. number one reason that people abandon websites is they cannot find desired content. Now, just so you know, I use this as an example. When you click on lung cancer, you do get the right page. I was going to ask Shirley to goodness because they actually, I don't know if they're your client, but I actually handled their law, their launch about 18 years ago for their very first site. Oh, good for you. Um, uh, Peter Morville, a very, very outstanding, probably one of the best information architects in the world, architected this site, and um, he did an Does extraordinary he... job. So what we see here is a loss of information sent, and whenever we put digital content assets on the website, number one, we need to establish information sent, we need to establish aboutness, what is this document about, and as long as we can maintain information sent, you're good as gold. So here's um, the notes for the people who wanted to know how to do an expectancy test. And here are the links on uh, how to do these usability tests. And um, now let's go into the definitions that we need to understand before we go to full scale into content assets. Sorry, can I ask you one quick? Can I ask you a quick question sure. about expectancy tests? In your opinion, does that need to happen, like during the wire if wireframe? When do people need to do? Well, for, for, certainly anybody with an existing website can do an expectancy test to diagnose potential uh, potential dead ends on their site. But what about like when you're creating the site up front? It's an expectancy tense test. I would still assume is important even at the front end. It is, and when we do expectancy tests, um, I have conducted thousands of usability tests. I've actually been, um, a lot of people don't know this, but I am actually a paid uh, usability test participant for the web search engines because I am a, a user. So I've had to actually be a part of usability tests. Uh, usability tests are best done before the site is made. So we tend to call it a formative test. You can do it on wireframes, you can do it on prototypes, you can do it on, if you use Photoshop, you can do it on a high fidelity prototype as well. And you can also do it on a current website to analyze what are people's mental models. So. That is a big deal, is to understand your user's mental models, because whenever you create site navigation, it needs to be based on your user mental models, not the technical team's mental models. Is the technical team going to buy your products and services? Is your technical team going to add links to, to a site? Are they going to be the ones that are doing the site prospecting? No. Who's going to be the people that are going to actually use your site? Those are the people that you conduct usability tests with. 
So I'm using a lot of technical jargon. So again, I'm going to go through some technical words, make sure we have effective communication, and another word that is, should be really important is context. Um, a friend of mine and, and uh, the, one of the founders of the Information Architecture Institute said, content may be king, but context is the kingdom. So what are we going to talk about? Information architecture. Simply put, it's organizing, labeling, and connecting website content so that it's easy to use and easy to find. And usability guru Jacob Nielsen points out that 77% of task failure on websites is due to IA issues. What comes first, information architecture or site navigation? Information architecture comes first. After you establish information architecture, then you can set up site navigation. Uh, information architects organize content in the following ways, and most of the time it's a combination of the above. And we're going to get into this because there's a common mistake that link builders make in information architecture, and I'm going to show you how to not do that and how to do it well. The scent of information, which Eric and Garrett and I have been talking about, consists of textual and graphical cues that communicate where am I, am I in the right place, where can I go, and how can I get there. Think elevator. Where am I? I'm on the seventh floor. Am I in the right place? How do you know you're on the seventh floor? The seven lights up, you hear a ding, the door is open, and there's usually a visual indicator that you're on the seventh floor. Where can I go? The elevator. It has buttons. It tells you where you can go. You can go to the eighth floor. You can go to the lobby. And in this case, if you press G, you're not going to the ground floor. You're going to the garage. And how can I get there? All links must look clickable and look tappable and be tappable. And all things that aren't tappable should not look tappable and should not look linkable. So information scent is huge because you establish information scent, people click. You lose or, or diminish information scent, you lose clients, you lose prospects, and you lose site visitors. We've been using the word mental model. All the mental model is is a way people view something. And you'd be very surprised in usability tests and usability studies that your users do not think the same way you do. Um, one of the most fun usability tests you can do is test using children. Um, my two-year-old nephew knows how to use his Nobby tablet better than any adult that I've ever seen. But it's also as simple as an on-off switch. How do you turn on the light in your hotel room? Sometimes the light switch isn't even findable, and sometimes the, the link to your digital assets are also not findable. So you need to understand your user's mental models and understand where they expect to see those links. Link building is a part of search engine optimization, and the one thing that we want you to know about SEO is it's not optimizing for technology only. Um, people who tend to optimize for search engine only tend to be search engine spammers. SEO is actually optimizing for people who use search engines. It's people who are going to add to cart. It's people who are going to sign up for webinars. It's people who are going to join Link Moses. And Eric knows that. So whenever he writes and he adds links to his site, he's doing it for his users. I do it for my users, and Garrett does too. Things SEO professionals are concerned with. Labeling a site content so that it's easy to find. That includes titles. That includes page headings. It also includes URLs. A URL is a content label. Organizing websites so that it's easy to find. That's usually the job of an information architect. And um, that's sometimes a good thing. And sometimes it's a bad thing because a lot of people think they have information architecture skills and they don't. We want to make sure search engines have access to desired content. We want users to have access to desired content. We want to ensure search engines don't have access to undesirable content. An example of undesirable content is duplicate content. 
a lot of people don't realize that tagging on a blog leads to duplicate content delivery and that's what search engines don't want. And in our case, earning a high number of high quality links. We like to call this a quantity of quality. We need to create link-worthy digital content assets, optimize them properly, and put them in the right place so people will link to them. And, let, and this is something important, um, and I've used this slide for years and years and years, and um, I haven't had to change it in years and years and years, because all web crawlers index text and follow links. This is something that's been true about search engines since Tim Berners-Lee invented the web. It's been true when Eric started back in 1994. It's true when I started in 95. And I don't remember the year Garrett started, but he's been doing this for quite some time too. All search engines index text and follow links. That means you have to label your content and you have to provide easy access to that content. Links are and will continue to be ranking factors. Right now, social signals are not ranking factors, but accommodating searcher goals and behavior has been a ranking factor since the mid-1990s. So there's a human element as well as a technical element to SEO. So there's only four things you need to remember about SEO. Text, you gotta put text on your pages that people can read. You've got to give easy access to that text. Think of link development as validation. People are validating that what you say about your content is true. And search your behaviors. Do, does your website validate very well-known and established searcher behaviors? And our focus today is on link development and social signals. So remember, human factors and technology factors, and that's it for the common vocabulary. Please feel free to ask us any questions if you don't understand a term. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Garrett and Eric because they're going to talk about the what, who, and why of digital content and digital assets. Thank you, Sherry. This, folks, this is why she's here. Did you? Did I hope you're taking notes. This, this, uh, these slides will be available, and Sherry's on Twitter. You can you can chase her down there and ask questions, and she, she has um, a library of content that she's written over the years and multiple books. Study her work. All right, folks. Um, Let me, so, Garrett. Uh, Garrett, yeah. it's one quick comment on Sherry too. She because she won't say it herself. Um, the, the concepts she's talking about are not just the difference between having a site that is pretty usable and helps accomplish things for the user versus awesome and perfectly architected. What Sherry's talking about actually affects the bottom line. In other words, especially if you're talking about an e-commerce site. Yeah. Um, site architecture that frustrates people can generally, one of the outcomes of that is they bail on your site before they complete a transaction. Why? Absolutely. Because if you want to talk about wayfinding or information center or what have you. So these kind of concepts that Sherry's talking about aren't just nice-to-haves. For many sites, they're the difference between being profitable and being incredibly profitable or being out of business. Eric, and I want to further that before we jump into this because this is a belief I have. I don't have um, I haven't done any studies, but I have the belief that when a potential linker, be they a links and resource page curator, be they a blogger, a reporter, a uh, you know a potential business partner, um, if they're looking at your content section of your website and they have a sense that it's very usable, very easy to navigate, and you're clearly communicating the depth of content on your website, this is, these are all usability things. These are all navigation things. These are all uh, information sent issues. Um, I hope I'm using the right words. <laughs> but these are all these are all the the types of of um, uh, cues that people look at on your website to determine whether you're legit, whether you are an authority. You know, if you've got one little resource page that's buried on your website 
orphaned as Sherry would call it, and there's really nothing supporting it. It's just kind of dangling out in the breeze, and there's no depth of authority. There's no depth of, of demonstration to the market or to the potential linker that you've been here for a while. You've been writing and thinking about this for a long time. If you're not communicating these things, you're not going to get as many links. People nope. aren't going to trust your website as much. You haven't established authority. And I believe that a strong uh, information architecture, um, solid navigation, clear um, relationships between uh, a, sing you know, a single link link uh, linkable asset on your site and your other linkable assets, uh, your other content assets, be they linkable or not, kind of showing the relationship uh, between um, and where where this specific document lives in your broader website, um, it, that all leads to someone may, having an easy yes when they link to you. Yeah, and all of these, yeah, 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 and all of these things. Shop. Yeah, you're, and the things you're talking about so much bleed over into the psychology of content uh, of design and content. In other words, a lot of these uh, every a lot of the things you're discussing are like internal dialogues and and feelings and questions people are asking themselves yep. as they look at any given piece yep. of content. Who's like who created this? Can I trust yes. this? Do, does this look like it got lifted? Are there typos here, man? I yeah. think I yeah. I mean all of these things are, are are little tiny things. It's almost like that the uns people are basically interviewing your content when they're considering yes. linking to it. The yeah. same way that you are interviewing somebody in front of you for a position with your company. Now you're having an inner dialogue, even as you ask them, tell me where you see yourself in five years. You're having an inner dialogue with yourself about a bunch of other things about that candidate that you're not going to necessarily ever tell them about. It's, or even it's, be aware of it. You know, it's similar with web content. There are so many, what I would call subtle, un, uh, uh, psychological th things that are taking place inside the potential link, uh, the grant the uh, link. editor, yep. writer, reporter's yes. head that that you're that 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 you can completely blow yes. based upon how you present your content. Yes, I think this is one of those, if, if you can get this aspect of your website right, not only is it going to impact the bottom line, as Eric mentioned, in terms of sales, but it, I really believe that if you're, you have a clearly thought through information architecture, it's going to make people much more likely to link to you, um, to your uh, to your to your con to a single page of your content, not to mention an entire category of your content. Yeah. Right? And we should also add on top of link, share. Sure, uh, sure. Be, you know, especially today. You know, in other words, the the same things that make somebody consider wanting to take the time to actually link to somebody's content also play a part in somebody's desire about whether or not they're going to choose to click the tweet button, the Facebook like button, or share, or the LinkedIn, or or what have you. These same things are at play, especially there where you know because people are known by the things that they tweet, whether or not they desire to be thought of as funny or a curator of quality information, etc. You know, you the 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 ability to earn those types of shares and links, etc., can really be influenced by your, your the presentation of your content. And this is why this folks, this is why it was an easy yes for us, for Eric and I to, to say how do we work to connect these dots between Sher what Sherry knows and what we know. But we're going to talk a little bit about what we know now uh, in terms of what makes content link worthy. What, or what is it? What can an asset be? Because um, I want us to think three dimensionally about this because it could be on your website, but it could also be e expertise, right? It could be a, a blog post, an article. Um, but but the, I think one of the core missing kind of, um, of assets is simply internal expertise in within a company. Now I'm not, I'm not saying this is something that's easy to unlock, but that's one of the kind of the, the most ignored, most commonly ignored um, uh, sort of link potentially linker valued assets at a website. So you know it, um, anything a calculator. Eric, help me out. What are, what are some things? What what are some asset types that you can you can think of? Just oh man, well the out. the chart that you've put right there is a great example with all of those bullet points. Um, cool. the, the, yeah, the types of digital content assets. Every single one of those represents its own potential to earn links and shares. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that every website is. 
can take advantage of or create this every everything sure. that's presented yeah. here. I mean, to each site, its own potential type of linkable assets. But uh, everything you, uh, I guess, the only thing I'm not seeing here, do I? And I may just be, you know, no, you've already got it. You've got the quizzes, you've got the tests. Uh, maybe one thing that uh, isn't there that. Um, because we're talk we talk so seriously about all this stuff. Sometimes some the, the thing. Remember what tends to get shared, and I'm not talking talking about necessarily hard links within like a blog post or an editorial link. But uh, think about internet memes and how many of them often tend to have a, a humorous element to them. So yeah. uh, uh, the, I, I, even when you're talking about a very serious subject, I think people um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of of uh, uh, of of humor, you know that humor is uh, it's a lot easier for people to share something that that might make somebody smile than it is to make somebody frown. Okay. And this is just a partial list, everybody. Um, uh, Ebooks are another type of digital asset, and the goal. And we're showing you this because this is something that you should consider before your site is built. What kind of content assets does my site need in order to encourage link development, in order to encourage trust, and in order to encourage people coming to the site and doing what you want them to do, such as add to cart, signing up for a webinar, subscribing to an RSS feed. And they also will allow, each of these has its own, what I would call, um, Link ceiling or or oh, linking destiny, if you want to put that. If you have a slideshow on your website, that's great. Well, what about making sure you also upload it to SlideShare or some of the other places where you can send that? You've got infographics. What are those infographics about? Oh, you're an accountant and you've got an infographic about accounting. Well, go out there on the web and find out those people who. And I'm not talking about submitting the infographic uh, of the day sites, which are a dime a dozen. But in other words, think of your white papers. Man, white paper submission campaigns can be gold if you identify the right places to put them. Uh, so, so not not just necessarily looking at this from the standpoint of could somebody link to this on my site and have a link to my site, but where can I distribute this content in addition to my own site so that it has the chance to get exposure and attention and build from build my brand? So uh, that that's the other element of this is yeah, it's great to create these so that you can potentially earn inbound links to it on your own domain, but also look at it from the standpoint of where can this also be distributed externally. Absolutely. So this is the what part. Um, and just so you know, um, we, we have included um, links in here for you. And, we, and if we come up with any other kind of resource, we'll add it to the presentation or we'll just send it out in the newsletter that follows. Um, so next, we're going to look at why it's important. So I, this is... It's funny, but this is definitely an overlooked aspect of campaign design, and and it's 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 wonderful. I love getting having those sort of stumped moments when someone asks me why. <laughs> Megan is amazing at this. When we're thinking about, and she'll just throw. Um, Ken McGaffin hit me with one of these today, just like. Why are we doing this? And then, and of course, the, the kind of the starting point is usually, well, the good links, but that's rarely enough of a why. Okay. So, wh what else? Why? Why are we creating an asset? Of course, you know, s bullet points. Obviously, we're trying to increase search engine traffic. Yes, we are we're trying to get more links, but we can also be increasing conversions. There, there are you can and should be designing campaigns for. Increasing conversions on your website, uh, designing assets that w are within the funnel of conversion, right? Um, top of funnel probably, but let's let's uh, let's think about newsletter signups, you know, as as a as a conversion type with, of course, with information, um, and and all this also can serve to establish trust, credibility, and then um, you know ha enable people to have a positive experience on your site. Um, I think th this, <laughs> it's, it's funny, but I, I really feel like, you know, as, as an, uh, you know, someone from the SEO industry, kind of our first question rarely is, uh, we rarely go beyond links, you know, get links. 
and I think that's a, a an important kind of extension to make. And Eric, would you talk about this a little bit? Because I know there was a time before uh, Google when you were thinking beyond, obviously you're thinking about getting links, but you weren't thinking about links for their search engine impact, you're thinking about them for the brand uh, impact that they could have, for yeah, the visibility and impact. Yeah, and I'll try to do it quick because I know, I, and I can tell we're probably going to go over because we've got a lot we want to get through yeah. and, it's, and it's 10 minutes till, but I, I was building links for four years for clients before there was a Google. Yeah. Um, so I was never building links for search rank because there were no, the search engines of the day, Lycos, AltaVista, Hotbot, um, uh, um, Web Crawler, InfoSeek, uh, World Wide Web Worm, w World Wide Web Wombat down in Australia and some others I'm probably forgetting. I mean there were about 10 search engines of the day that you would, uh, and I get the best way really is actually to use a case study and try to do it in 30 seconds. One of my first clients here locally was C. Ray Boats. They're based in Knoxville. It, I considered it an, a huge get because I was still taking graduate classes and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I got C. Ray Boats as a client. They were kind of ahead of their time. They were, get, they were getting on the web in the early 90s um, and they got on the web with uh, PDF, they had a library of PDFs for people who had, you know, the small ski boats and fishing boats with a PDF library for maintenance. So, because a lot of skier, you know, if you have a ski boat or a fishing boat, you're going to do your own maintenance rather than paying money or whatever. So, they had these downloadable content assets. So, now it's my job to go out and, and, and say to myself, okay, who's going to care about the fact that Sea Ray Boats has a website? Now, again, no, Google doesn't exist yet. There are no search engines that care about links for the purposes of ranking this website. So my goal is simply to bring attention to the fact that C-Ray has a website. Well, who would give a sh well, who would care that C-Ray has a website? Yeah. So I go to the search engines of the day and I start doing searches on things like, oh, um, boat maintenance maybe. Or you know, boat maintenance, uh, water skiing, uh, pleasure boating, fishing boats. Um, you know, boat safety, and as I go through and I do that, I'm starting to notice things. It's like, first of all, I'm starting to notice things like, oh, wow, look at all of these marinas. Uh, marinas are showing up because mm -hmm. almost every single city that's on, on the water has a marina or more than one marina, and they were starting to get on the web too, and what did those marina websites have? They would typically have useful links. Here's our hours of operations. Here's we got a restaurant on site. Here's much it cost for a boat slip, and useful links, and then on the useful links page would be links to boater safety, links to boating manufacturers, bingo. And now Sea Ray Boats is for the first time online, so I send an email out to the people that run those websites at whatever, you know, that Miami, Bay, Biscayne Bay Marina. Hi, I, uh, my name's Eric Ward. I'm working with Sea Ray Boats. They've just launched their website for the very first time. It has the following really cool information. I noticed on your marina website that you've got a collection of links, specifically a, link, a list of boating manufacturers. I am hoping that you might, as time permits, take a look at the Sea Ray site and add it to your list if you feel it's merited. And so I probably contacted 40 or 50 marina websites. The other thing I noticed when I was doing those searches, like on boater safety, is how many public libraries within those same areas where they were on coastal communities would have sections related to boater safety and would have sections related to boating or whatever. And sometimes there would be an opportunity for a link there as well. So anyway, now flash forward to when Google launches. And everybody's saying Google bases their rankings upon how, uh, on links, and I'm thinking, oh geez, I've been working, I've got, I've been doing work with all these clients for all these years. I better do some searches and see where my clients rank. And Sea Ray Boats was the very first one that I did, and I remember that I went to Google and I did a search on the phrase ski boats, and the very and at position one was Sea Ray Boats, and I was like, holy crap, I don't know <laughs> why, I don't know how, but. Whatever it was that I've been doing for the past four years was exactly what this so-called new search engine that studies links or that looks at links wanted. And that was, I didn't know anything about links at that point from, because no engines looked at them. It was at that day, it was on that moment that I realized, okay, I got to figure out what I did right. And that's when I hired actually a buddy of mine that worked at the University of Tennessee that knew Pearl, wrote me the uh, Pearl script to do a, a link colon, because back then you could do link colon at Google and get every single freaking link that linked to any website. They hadn't turn the spigot off, they'd tell you whatever you wanted to know. And he dumped it into a, he dumped it into a CSV, I pulled that into Excel, I, ran, I wrote a couple of macros, and it was then that I realized when I compared Sea Ray Boats that ranked first to all of the other sites that did not, because I'm trying to figure out what I did right, and what I did right was that none of those other websites had links from libraries or marinas or one of the keys that I also found was universities that had ski clubs. 
I remember one of the places I got my very first link was a University of Georgia. Their ski club was called the Ski Dogs, and they had a section of useful uh, water ski links with boating manufacturers. And I remember the day I sent the president of the University of Georgia Ski Dogs an email letting him know about Sea Ray. He put that link in there before the end of the day. So now I've got yeah. a new link for you know. So now they've got a new link. Not that the all edu, not that edu is the you know the gold standard, but just to make my point here is, I ended up in it, un, without understanding that I was doing so, creating the exact kind of backlink profile that Google wanted to see. Why? Because I wasn't building links for Google because I didn't know about Google and no engines cared about links. Therefore, I had to only do outreach to people who would just who would frankly give a shit that C Ray had a website. <laughs> In other words, my, my, my thinking is, who will care that C Ray is online? And then by going through that process, I identified the exact kind of sites that Google ultimately wanted to see as well. So it was completely by accident that this came about, and, and that took way longer to, 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 to no, explain. No, this but. is, it, it, from, from a link building perspective, thinking about who is going to care, I think that's the number one sort of starting point when you're doing prospecting and certainly when you're brainstorming what you're going to be doing right when you're designing your website when you're thinking about topics uh, that's the time to start thinking about your linking audience as well and that's who Eric is just absolutely uh, incredible at, at sniffing out and thinking about and and that perfectly illustrates the the finding that audience who cares about a URL and it, really it, it's finding an audience who cares about a topic and that's what what it, that just does so well so we, we're talking about audiences that linkers value this is the citation labs thinks we we, we don't just think about who's going to value a topic but who's going to value because at this point the there probably aren't as many people who are willing to link to boat manufacturers there might be but I think they get a lot of emails probably so we are thinking a lot about who are the audiences that these linkers are are who, who do these linkers um, create content for right oh, yeah it's, yeah I totally agree today if sea ray boats comes to me with a, a, a I gotta say no you know what you've got all the you've got the overwhelming majority of links that you need you need to give away a boat for Christmas on the sea ray boats Christmas boat yeah. giveaway yeah yeah. You know, and, and that I can that I can generate awareness for. So, Absolutely. you, you yeah. know, so it's it very much it it, it it things change over time. It's a different era. Yeah, yeah. I still think you know there there might be some people who would, but then the impact you would have would probably be fairly low. But we do think so. So we've we've really looked at um, one about one point uh, two to three million um, link pages like actual links and resource pages now we're still in the process of categorizing them not by hand we're sort of figuring out how to categorize but some of the topic areas uh, what we call a linker valued audience or a, a, a linkable topic if you will that we've discovered is stuff like seniors and disabilities um, uh, parenting I mean we've got I think Megan wrote an article of about 600 different linker valued audiences. So oftentimes when we're designing a linkable piece of content that we know we can promote and earn links to, we're thinking about how do we intersect client topic with um, a, a, an audience that for, that the people uh, who, who uh, the people value and create links pages for and blogs for. So, they're not necessarily in funnel, right? So we do think about out of funnel content that can still be topically relevant. And then, but then also there's the in funnel content for people who are definitely in your market, right? So not every piece of content is necessarily, when we're designing in our, our um, the no gravity space of trying to earn links, we, we're, we're not necessarily creating content that is in funnel or you know thinking about our target market. But this is where this is this is why I'm so always so intrigued by uh, Sherry's thinking is because how do we how do we justify writing something for seniors on a website that maybe their core market isn't seniors or it isn't people with disabilities or it isn't uh, and these are all great air you know great um, audiences to write for whether you get links or not 
right? Like making something relevant to seniors or figuring out a way to help seniors with what you're already doing or help people with disabilities with what you're already doing. These are great things to do. These are good. <laughs> Pat yourself on the back. You're thinking about great audiences who are in need. This is good. Um, but they're not necessarily your buying audience, right? So we do, we, we and we, we're increasingly, you know, folks are like, well, this is great. We got some great links to this content, but we're really wanting links to our content that will sell. And so we do, uh, of course, have to think about the buying audience as well. But and and, and they're, but but within even your your buying audiences, the names that they'll have will be different in the marketplace or on websites than what you call them internally. So your your persona A. Um, may not actually be called Persona A in the marketplace. They may have a different name for themselves. So there's still a lot of learning you can do about who your audience is and more importantly, what your audience calls itself. And I feel like that's um, uh, potentially related to a mental map. What is the audience's mental map of itself? Who, what is their identity? But so often this goes unexamined as well. Uh, and even, even uh, you know, um, organizations that are that are content forward, uh, content marketing, inbound marketing organizations, they're still thinking about their market as they define it, as opposed to how like the kind of the subset audiences within that market. Um, so anyhow, uh, just a long way of saying think about your audience, uh, think about your market as an audience, and then think about audiences who are not your market, and 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 figure out how you can serve them. That's where links are going to come from. So this is the who. Um, and I, I'm going to add something, and this might amuse all of you. Um, my mentor is Dr. Susan Weinshank, and she's known as the Brain Lady. And what she taught me was um, directly related to this. All humans have an old brain and a new brain. The new brain is at the front, the old brain's in the back. And men and women all react to the same basic things. Can I eat it? Will it eat me? Can I have sex with it? <laughs> we don't have control over this. We just react. And there's a really good book called Eye Tracking Web Usability. And you can see what men look at and what women look at on web pages. And so when uh, what <laughs> sadly that, men sadly men find out the answer to number three by trial and error. Which is true, and women, we do look at cleavage. It's about time for us to admit it. Um, but what they're saying here, it's seniors and disabilities, people in need of aid of information, that is, can I eat it? Will it eat me? Will it eat me involves safety. We all react to safety without thinking about it. Security so a lot of digital absolutely. assets that you're creating are things that people react to with their old brain. So always remember, can I eat it? Will it eat me? Can I have sex with it? People all act the same way. So can, now we're going to get to... I can to, sense another webinar coming. I think this could be really interesting. Oh, yeah, I'd like that one. <laughs> we'll, we'll get Susan to join. She's hilarious. So we're, so we're going next to finding digital assets. We know sure, who our target sure. audience is. We, we know what kind of assets they want because don't put videos on your site if your target audience doesn't want to look at videos. Sure. If they're blind, you know. Um, yes. So, or they just don't like, it's not videos that they want. If right, right. People want infographics. Flipping, There's not, there are people who don't like infographics. And I, and here's a pet peeve of mine. These infographics that are huge. The point of this infographic is to communicate information quickly and easily. Digestible, no. So just make sure that if you're doing infographics as a digital asset, that your target audience wants them and you've done your due diligence. And one of the things you should do before creating your content assets is finding them not only on your own site, but what you see your competitors doing not only on the web but also in social media so I'm going to hand this back to Garrett yeah um, we, we look at um, we'll find you know of course top competitors typically we're looking we'll either have clients self ID competitors we'll also take their top 100 keywords and see who's ranking consistently across those and just take a peek at what they're doing 
right? Like what are they doing for, where are they already earning links? How are they earning links? And I don't mind this approach, but also I feel like there's some, uh, it, it, it's tough to scale this approach from an agency perspective. So, we, but we do this sort of analysis to kind of learn, are there any audiences we've overlooked? Um, and, you know, and that's a key question to ask from an agency perspective when, when we're thinking about content design. It's like, are there any unexpected audiences that, that are um, big fans of your service or products that you never would have thought of and then that you're not really serving yet with content? And that's, that's a key question also. But, um, th yeah, this is where you're sort of looking around to see what others have done. I'm not a huge fan of, of uh, copying competitors. I don't dislike it. But I'm also, and you know, if there's something easy uh, that that's duplicatable, let's go and and do, let's do it, you know. But I think I we don't spend too much time there. But the the core thing is you can discover uh, topics or content directions or even asset types that you wouldn't have considered otherwise. So it, it's you know it's useful, just like you know in an academic sense. If you're going into a you know a new area of study, you need to read widely. You should definitely read and and sort of research widely when it comes to what have our uh, competitors done. Um, and certainly you know just look at their home page and poke around and, and uh, look at them in Majestic and you can look at their most linked pages to get an idea of, of what's been the most linked to, what's been the most cited document on their site, and then absolutely looking at social media um, to see what has um, caught fire, so to speak, uh, in, in the social media that is your, um, where, where your market lives the the one the one thing the one caveat here is that they're primarily your competitors are looking at just from a pure pure link building perspective your competitors are probably focused on just in funnel link building so they're leaving links on the table by not writing for other linker valued audiences or trying to discover other linker valued audiences so that's one thing to to kind of um, uh, be aware of but that's also that's very very obviously if you know if they're there, we're going to assume that if, if if there's if they've pursued a link on a certain site, we're going to presume that there was a uh, economic reason for that. There was some benefit to them, so it's definitely a, a very important place to look. Eric, can you talk a bit about your from your angle um, competitors uh, link analysis, competitive link analysis? Sure. Let me mention that thank you to the audience because I know we've gone over and it looks like we've retained almost 100% of the people that we had. So so until we, until that number dive bombs, I'll, I'm, I'm able to continue to, to go and I'm thrilled that we've got people who are still out there listening. Um, but to your question um, about uh, um, repeat it again, just because my my what I, do you do uh, from a competitive perspective? Oh, yeah, for competitive, now, competitive analysis. Um, yeah. The the I think it's one of the most widely made tactical mistake. It's a t it's one tactic. It's important uh, from a competitive intelligence perspective to know who's linking to all of your competitors, and and more specifically, not just to their homepage because anybody can figure out a way to get a link to their homepage, but to better understand where are my competitors able to attract links within their content, what's resonating in their websites and generating links. However, I don't believe, the way, I, the way I put it is, if you just chase the links your competitors already have, you're playing keep up with the Joneses. It's like you're running a marathon and they are continually two steps ahead of you. And as they get another new link and take another step, you get another link that, that they left behind for you and you take another step, but you're still destined to always be behind them. Um, and, and not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but that should only be one piece of an yeah. overall competitive linking strategy. My favorite approach, and I know it's counterintuitive because most clients, still, when, I ask, when, I, when, when I ask the client, who's your competitors? And I ask it open-ended. I never say, who's your Google competitors? I purposely ask, who's your competitors? Because all of them will always answer, well, everybody that's ranked ahead of me. And I'll tell them, oh, well, actually, the sites that are your competitors, sure, I agree with you, but the other sites that are your competitors are the sites that are ranked behind you. Well, why are they my competitors? Well, they're not standing still, and neither are Google search results. And the site that's ranked ninth, even though you're ranked fourth, is the site that may end up ranked third a month from now. So I, it's, 
I, I call it the the apple orchard approach. In other words, take the if you're ranked sixth, take every site in the top 15, run a backlink profile on every single one of them, and and look at the best links that every single one of them has. Then put them into a big bucket. Don't worry about which of your competitors it was linking to because I don't want your linking strategy to be driven by the guy that was ranked ahead of you or behind you. What we're saying is every apple tree is going to have some good apples and some bad apples, but we're going to take all 15 of those apple trees, all 15 of those competitors, and we're going to recognize that every tree is going to have some good, some bad, and some rotten. And what I want is I want the good that they all have. And now I want to go after as many of those as possible, not just targeting one. Because I know I'm going to be successful in some cases, some I'm never going to get on because there was a pre-existing relationship that allowed for them that, to get that link in the first place. But what I'm saying here is if I get just 10% of the best links off every one of those 15 trees, collectively what I've got is now more powerful than any one of them, and I win. And I want to add something here because I I I do exactly what Eric and um, Garrett do most of the time. I just say to my clients about work with them; they're the best. You learn opportunities. I can tell you right now, there is a missed opportunity that has been rampant in the medical and the healthcare industry. Doctors and healthcare professionals write for doctors and other healthcare professionals. They might have things for patients, but the audience they have overlooked are the patient caregivers. The youngest baby boomers are 51 years old, and a lot of them are taking care of elderly parents. Xers are taking care of elderly parents. This is an audience that's not going to disappear. Now, there's so much more than just link target. One of the probably most successful consults I ever had was with a California organic produce. You, you would know it if I said the name, but I don't. I mean, uh, it was Earthbound Farm. Okay, so now that I've said it, uh, okay, so they're everywhere. They're they're in grocery stores all over the country now. Let's go back a decade ago. It might even have been farther than that. We do a backlink analysis on this. And one of the things we learn in looking at one of their competitors' backlinks, it, we see a link to a trade show. I mean, there was a link to a .org, and that immediately is like, well, why has one of your competitors gotten a link from a .org? And then we look at this .org, and it's actually a, a, a grocery it's, – it's a trade show. It's an industry-specific trade show, and it's in Georgia. And my client says, why the heck is my competitor – and, and the link was there because in this trade on the trade show website in Georgia for the organic grocery manufacturers associate uh, or for the Southeastern Grocery Manufacturers Association, they had paid to be a sponsor and exhibitor. And as a result of that, what did they have? They had a link on the trade show website, which showed up in the backlink analytics. So now my client, who does not market at all east of the Mississippi River, is saying, wait a minute. Why is one of our biggest competitors, they don't market east of the Mississippi, why are they sponsoring and exhibiting at a trade show in Georgia? Well, there can only be one reason. They're considering expansion. So by looking at the backlink profile of a competitor, they were able to learn, and it, it basically put it on their radar, wait a minute here, one of our competitors is actually spending money to have an exhibit. They're going to have to f spend a ton of money to fly a staff out. They're, p they're paying to be in the exhibit hall, and they're going to be attending this trade show that's taking place in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a market we know they have never sold to before. How did we find that out? Backlink, backlink analysis. It wasn't a link opportunity for them. They didn't, there was, they didn't sell there, but what it told them was, holy crap, one of our competitors is about to expand east of the Mississippi. We need to meet and discuss this. And to me, that was like the most awesome bit of competitive intel that backlink that, – that, I mean, to me, that's where, why backlink intelligence can be so incredibly powerful because it can tell you what your competitor is doing today and what they might be thinking about doing tomorrow. Yes, and they are thinking, can I eat it? Will it eat me? Can I have sex with it without realizing it? Well, most, oh. organic, pro most organic produce is just horrible when it comes to sex. It's just no fun. <laughs> yeah, it is. 
<laughs> that would be a can I eat it example. Okay, so, that's what I'm, thank you. Okay, thank you for clarifying because now I understand why it's gone so bad for me with the organic produce. Exactly. <laughs> so once we identify what our content assets are, who our target audience is, where are our link opportunities, we have to make that URL shareable and linkable. And oh, just, don't get me started. No, this is so usability centered because a URL is a document label and document labels need to be human friendly as well as technology friendly. So Eric's going to take us through well, what makes I feel URL. Like I, I like yeah, I talk too much. Garrett, do you want to start or do you want me to just kind of do an intro and turn it over to you? Are you kidding me? This is okay. this is home turf, Eric Ward home turf. Tell okay, us. Okay, well I'm going to no, no, start no. with I'm going to I'm going to start with my pet peeves. It's Please. like and 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 this is something that it goes back and it still happens today. Um, URLs can be can be absolutely unshareable. And what I mean by that is the most easy the easiest answer is first of all, don't make the mistake in thinking that everybody reads email using an HTML email reader. I for one do not. Uh, although I can, I choose my base level setting is I want to read my emails in text. Have you ever seen an, an URL break because it's so long in email so that now you have to copy and paste two pieces of a URL together in a tiny quarter inch window? That's not happening. That's a deal breaker. Unshareable, unclickable, not going to happen. So sometimes a URL can be too long. And that's just one example of an unshareable URL. Um, so and Garrett, again, I don't want to dominate the conversation here. Um, the other thing is, in, with the advent of social media, sometimes URLs can take up so many characters of a tweet or whatever that, no. and, and I know that Twitter's doing a better job of that because, I mean, they also have their own URL shortener with Tico. But, but the reality is, in my personal opinion, the longer any URL is, that even if it is, even if it is incredibly descriptive, the longer any URL is, there is a psychological bias in some cases against them because a lot of people feel that, well, if content is truly epic and, and awesome and truly useful, wouldn't that content tend to be closer to the top level domain name? And even though I might argue with them that depending on the architecture that there are instances where the answer would be no, the reality is that I have seen over and over a bias against URLs that are too long. In other words, a URL can be so long it's unshareable. It can have characters in it that make it look like gibberish that end up making it look like, gee, that might not be permanent. That almost looks right. like, is right. that a session ID? Is that I something that's going to break a, a spider? Yeah. Is that, does, that looks like a URL that's not going to be around forever. Is that a tracking URL or are they just trying the to scan URL it? is the first, the first impression that, well, almost, that someone has of your website, right? Before they click it, they're looking at it. And if this thing feels like it's going to break, right? If it feels rickety, uh, you know, is this going to be permanent? Um, why would I want to link to something that's going to move or not be there in six months? Now yeah, I've got I mean, to go back and fix my website. You, know? you might as well have a, a, direct, a subdirectory that says these URLs, any URL beyond this point may not be here permanently. <laughs> <laughs> All ye who enter will perish. Or, yeah, uh, it's, it, I mean, it's like, uh, and, and, and it's awkward too because when you're having when you're doing these consults with people especially when you've got somebody else on the phone the marketing team the 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 uh, uh, the the, uh, uh, I, the the information guys you know the guys that run the server especially if there's a guy in the meeting that actually came up with the site architecture and the naming what's the sherry the naming uh, uh, Link. Yeah, you know, you, you whatever their, their 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 naming classification system was and you see that it was it was not helpful from from a linking standpoint. Now I'm now you're faced with that awkward question of saying, guys, um, I never want to actually say to him, man, somebody made a really asinine decision about your <laughs> URL structure. I can't say that, but what I have to somehow convey to them is that there are, they they have hampered their ability to attract links by virtue of a decision they made about their site architecture and labeling. Yeah, URL red flags, and I think another one would be on on my end when I'm pick, pitching to links and resource pages. Now these these are curators; these are people who are different from people who own and operate blogs. They have different um, reasons for publishing, right? Maybe say the similar audiences, but you know different reasons for publishing. If I'm a links and resource page curator, and I've got a collection of 50 of the best links on the internet about 
boating, let's say, and I see something, boating might not even be a great example, but it's boating, and something is on a blog. Uh, I'm not going to trust that as much as being an evergreen type of, uh, uh, a, an evergreen document, if it lives on, if the word blog is in the URL. Like right, just in that string, that's going to turn me off. I'm looking for, you know, your resources section or your education yeah, seen, section. Yeah, I've seen worse than that, and since it's the Mayo Clinic, I'm a little bit more confident. But I've got to tell you that the tail end of that on the far right bothers me. You know that C O N dash two zero three five one zero one that bugs me because yeah. that, that's, that's that's something. That's a tip, though. This is called front loading, and for those of you who who um, have been watching, I we did link to a Marketing Land article that gives you some guidelines. Now, one of the things to do is something called front loading. You front load your URLs with your most important words. So, what Mayo Clinic did well is they front loaded with their most important words, and they put the nonsense stuff at the end. So if you have a content management system that has to use the funky characters or the the um, session IDs or the numbers that people don't understand, if you front load your URLs, you will. And also remember, these are this is going to appear. The URL appears in Google search results. What do you guys think the CON stands for? Just out of curiosity. I mean, go back to that page real quick. Why did yep. they do What does CON stand for? I think it's something that means something only to people internally there. They didn't think of the end user. What does CON mean? It was probably a, techni it was a technical person. Now, is it conditions? Is it short for conditions? Mm. It might be. Yeah, so condition number 2035101. Condition, yeah, like that would be. But most As a people. Linker, that, I trust that more. Yeah. Yeah, but but you and I know that our, we've done this enough that we see CON and we think, oh, they must mean condition. But the casual user looking at that might not. Likewise, we got to hope that if we have if we're building links for this page, we got to hope that they understand. I would rather that actually go. I mean, the URL is long enough. Go ahead and put condition. And yep. why'd you have to get? And why'd you have to give it a meaningless number? That you know, it's like why why not give me condition dash influenza? Why does it have to be 20035? Now, I understand that it may be too late. And I don't know that in this particular case it's an absolute deal breaker from a link building perspective. But the re but for me personally, in a perfect world, I would want to make changes to that URL. I understand it's front loaded well, it's back loaded poorly. Exactly. And that is something for all of you to think about before you purchase any kind of content management software. Having control of URLs especially to your content assets, is going to be critical. And it's very critical for people who want to go directly to your content assets. So are there any other tips you guys can offer of making a URL shareable and a URL unshareable? I think well, trustable the, is, a, is, a good, is another good way to think about shareability, is do I trust this URL? Um, and, and, I, and I think a lot about the inbox. Right, like because that's kind of the first encounter that a potential linker has, oftentimes with your uh, domain or, or with. So, I think about um, trustability in the URL, and uh, it's a granular place to work. But folks, I, I believe it has impact, um, and I think um, kind of picking your audience and thinking clearly ahead of time about who your target linking audience or sharing audience is going to be should play into the URLs that you're creating. So if you're yeah, going after links and resource people, page folks, then you know the blog isn't going to be great. But if you're going after bloggers, if you're, if you're working with bloggers and industry folks in your industry, there's nothing wrong with a blog, your blog being in the URL. Right. You know, and some CMS systems even recognize what we're talking about. Especially, I mean, you look at WordPress and the various flavors of WordPress. There's a reason when you're creating a new document that it has the ability to let you edit the permalink up there. It's almost like it's, it, it knows that, gosh, this guy just wrote an article and that and his headline has nine words, which means nine dashes, because the default setting for that CMS is it's going to use every word of your article title in the URL path, and and most people don't want that because now it's a, a really ridiculously long URL. That's why it even has the ability right up there to edit that down to something however you want to. I went through this just within this past week. I rarely use the default URL path that WordPress wants to give me. I'm thinking I, from this standpoint, I never use it. What, what will make this 
most apparent to an end user who might only see the URL itself and have to make a decision about what that content might be behind it. And also consider the shorter the URL, the better. Search engines want the shortest URL possible that communicates aboutness. And I just highlighted um, on this page I am, we're giving you as a resource, um, you don't have a lot of screen real estate on a mobile device. Oh, goodness. Don't waste space. That's important to users. So um, I highly encourage all of you to read this. Um, again, it has a URL checklist, and it also, also warns you, you could be preventing access to your URLs by robots exclusion, by orphaning, siloing, and using technologies that could really affect your URL. So this is a good checklist. Sherry, I, I, I want to I, I commend you for actually speaking the word siloing without retching. <laughs> So um, normally, when Sherry says the word "siloing," it's followed up by the sound of her vomiting. And you can hear her teeth and gritting. You can, and, and you can hear it in the back. Actually, yep. you can hear her beating the walls. With her <laughs> I, I took my boys. I took my medication before I okay, did this. Good, good. Glad to hear so, you that. Know, I'm going uh, to uh, tell all of you this right now because we're going to move on to the next part of this. So again, here's your helpful links. Is where do these shareable links live this in is, your this is, architecture and where do you place mode. them on your website and I'm going to tell you a resource it's called information architecture for the World Wide Web I have a screenshot of it and in that book it is said for years and years and years silos do not add to findability they actually decrease it and I'm going to show you how to fix that so now we don't need any antacids anymore. So where <laughs> am I? The three things I'm going to show are the types of website navigation that every website should have except the smallest of the small sites. And again, information architecture for the World Wide Web is one of my Bibles. Um, and just so you know, you're probably going to more, know more by the end of this presentation than most SEOs on the planet because search engine optimizers and software developers and computer programmers are not taught architecture and navigation. They assume they know it. And that's not a good thing because we all know that your target audience does not have the same mental models as your technical team. I'm going to show you where to put the digital content assets and I'm going to show you some common mistakes. So let's review. Information architecture, organizing, labeling, and connecting websites to support usability and findability. In other words, the goal of information architecture, make your content easy to use, easy to find. Information architecture should be based on user mental models, not the mental models of your technical team, not the mental models of your marketing team, not your mental model, and that's not really hard. Easy, yeah, not it's what's easiest for you. Exactly. It's based on your users. Information architecture precedes technical architecture. So you should have your labeling system set up before you launch your website. So if you're adding content assets as an afterthought, you're already behind. This is something you should do before. Keep in mind the definition of site architecture is information architecture plus technical architecture. And as I said, most web developers and SEO professionals, unfortunately, are not trained or educated. But I'm here to help everyone. So this is what happens if you don't address architecture. As Nielsen said, 77% of task completion failures is due to architecture. If you catch it early in the design phase, as, as Eric mentioned earlier, with prototypes, you're good as gold. If you wait till the, the, the developers st started coding, it's not as good, but it's not as bad as waiting till after the site's launched. Just know that as the general rule, if you can do this before the site is launched, you are way ahead of the game. So. The good news is that I'm showing you what to do. There are five types of website navigation, global, local, contextual, and supplemental. Utilities usually is where login lives, a link to your home page, about us, 
help, FAQs, that's what, and cart is usually in your utilities menu. People expect to see that in the upper left-hand corner. Global navigation is usually the navigation bar you see at the top as well as your fat footer at the bottom. Local navigation gets more specific. So your label should get more specific as people go down your hierarchy. They typically appear on the left side of the page. They can appear on the right side of the page. And sometimes they appear directly below global navigation, which we see on mobile devices. Contextual links and supplemental links are so powerful. And I'm telling you right now, contextual links and supplemental links will make or break your search engine visibility and your site usability. So here are your recommended readings. Um, fantastic books. They are signed copies, and they're very well loved in my Sherry's personal bookshelf. Um, these are the links that will make or break. I'm not saying that global and local links aren't important. Of course they are. But I would, would expect people to use um, card sorting and, and reverse card sorting usability tests to determine global and local navigation. It's contextual and supplemental navigation that ha carry heavy, heavy, heavy weight when search engines, as well as users, determine aboutness of your site and the unique content fingerprint of all of your digital assets. So context is the kingdom. It is true content is king. But you have to show people how to link to your content. And you've always got to put your content in context. And as long as it's in context constantly, you're going to have better search engine traffic, you're going to have better sense of information, and you're going to have better conversions. Um, so tip number one, always put your links in context. Navigation labels should be clear from user's perspective. Some contextual links can be programmed, and some contextual links should be curated. I'm going to give you some examples. Okay, so here is marketing land. Eric, what page am I viewing? What section of the site am I in? Whose site am I in? Analytics and conversion. Right. Whose site am I visiting? I got lucky. Yes, you are. Yes. It's a link, so they did a good job. Whose site am I viewing? Uh, marketing, uh, marketing land, but only because I know that. Right. Okay, we that's fine. Which section of marketing land are you in? Analytics and conversion. How can oh, yeah. you? Only because of that ridiculously small analytics and conversion label above the search box. Can you tell or, us on or, Mar can I where does analytics and conversion live? Under Martech, CMO, social, SEM, SEO. Hmm. That's a mistake. Well, it better live under analytics. It better live under analytics, and analytics should be highlighted. So that is something that everybody should know. Within 0.5 seconds, people determine where am I. And if it takes them longer than 0.5 seconds when they look at a web page to determine where am I, you are slowing down task completion. So always, always tell your users in your site navigation and in your content labels, including your URL as a document label, where am I? And man, what I'm, is the content I'm about? Guilty. I'm guilty of that on my own site, man. Bad. Everybody's guilty. There's no such thing as a perfect site, but just know this. So this site did okay. That's why I picked it, because it's a very search engine land and marketing land rank constantly, and they do a lot of things right. So let's see some of the things that they did right. Now, I have a pet peeve, and this is... Not only do I have hissy fits, and hissy fit is a gentle way of saying rah, 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 of I don't, siloing actually does not make your content more findable. Anytime you hear the term internal site architecture, you're dealing with a person who doesn't know what they're talking about. Internal site architecture means site navigation. Duh. Okay. Another thing to know is that there is a term called inline or embedded text links that carry heavy information sent. So whenever you write a blog post, whenever you write any kind of content that's link worthy, try to use relevant inline text links and use them 
sparingly because you want your content to be easy to read. Garrett, first link, technology-based users. What page do you think you're going to find? We're going to click on this link. Tell me what you expect to see. Only from picking up contents, uh, context such as search engines, I'm looking at the um, crawler access, I think. Um, exactly. And guess what? That was a very appropriate link. Like I said, normally in an expectancy test, you wouldn't tell people what you expect to see. Another inline text link. Eric, what would you expect to see by clicking on this link? Hopefully something written by Jared Smith. Exactly. So not only is there context in the inline text link, there's context next to the inline text link. So everybody, use inline text links sparingly but appropriately. They provide the best context to both search engines and users. And, and notice... That's your, yeah. Yeah, let's remember Google also has a t patent on adjacency. Exactly. And actually all search engines <laughs> right now, the web, major web search engines do have patents. So do this. Curated inline text links. And again, don't forget usability. The longer the article, let's say it's a blog post, the more inline text links you can put in because you, you have content. The shorter ar the article, the less inline text links you can use. These are curated text links. The author should be the one adding the inline text links. There is another type of text link called related. And as long as they're topically specific, you will also gain a lot of value from these. So in WordPress, you can add related blog posts. So again, this is something that the author or a topic authority should be picking. So make sure you use inline text links and make sure you have related relevant articles. Don't link to something that's unrelated in the curated part of your website. Programmable contextual links, for example, might be most popular and also most recent. Again, these are things that you commonly see programmed into WordPress, Magento, Drupal, all kinds of other things. Now, look at these, these links. Are they contextual? What does procrastination and tongue problems have to do with each other? <laughs> What does Cyber Monday, and these are things, uh, the, this one's from CNN, Cyber Monday. Isn't Cyber Monday over? Oh, I hate that. Oh, man, so many sites do that, stuff that's old. So keep in mind, um, one of the things that Garrett and, and Eric put is it, it, your site needs to be evergreen as much as possible. It's okay to think, have linkable content that's timely. But keep in mind, that might have a short lifespan. And another thing I want to point out is when we do usability tests, uh, as much as designers ha hate this, the blue looks more clickable than the black. And we tend to find people clicking the graphic image more than clicking on the black link. So make sure your links look clickable. So yes, you can have these. But don't put them front and center. If you're going to put something front and center, put your, your related posts and your inline text links first on a web page. If you're going to add programmable ones, make sure they appear after the content and after those other type of links. Cool. Excellent. Here's another issue. So here's CNN again. Um, do any of you know Newt the Polar Bear? Newt the polar bear, my niece loves Newt the polar bear. Now, Newt the polar bear passed away, unfortunately, and they found out the reason he passed away were his genetic reasons. But look at what they put more from CNN. What does Bill Cosby have to do with Newt the polar bear? I, th I, think, he, I, I think he slipped the, the polar bear some, a roofie. Oh, there you go. What is Star Wars? Is there going to be a polar bear? in the Star Wars movie? Ironically, the, the line there is, please stop forcing Star Wars on me. And it is a little bit forced here, though. Let's, 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 and just so you know, do those links look clickable? 
No. So they're not encouraging people to click on these links. So none of these links are contextual, and none of these links are formatted to encourage people to click on it. So this is why you have to watch out for what people say and what software, out-of-the-box software does, because they're putting things on your web pages that distract people from completing their tasks and distract people from linking to your digital assets. So this leads to my second tip. Any of you that use WordPress, this is a no. I'm going to ask uh, Eric, what do you expect to see when you click on 2014 in January. What topic do you expect to see? What topic? Yes. Okay, Eric just gave the classical WTF expression that I see in usability tests all of the time. Well, WTF, um, pardon my language, it means what yeah. the fuck. Um, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to expect to see the topic of stuff that they wrote in February of 2014. People don't click on these links because they have no context. So don't use archiving software. The people who created the archiving software did not create them to provide context. So if you're going to use the archiving um, software, use it in a category page. So at least you have January. This is the recipes for January 2015 at least there's some context rather than this nonsense that you see right here. Um, the other thing not to do, don't do tagging. And that might seem so counterintuitive to um, what a lot of people recommend, but to a search engine, tagged content, tagged links is duplicate content. And that's what search engines don't want is duplicate content. Now, if you find people like to use your tagging pages, then you're going to have to manage your duplicate content. And now you have to hire a technical SEO to help you filter out the content you want to deliver to search engines and the content that you don't want to deliver to search engines. And just so you know, um, people don't click on tag clouds. Um, I've been usability testing since um, 2002. And as a navigation option, tagging is not something that users click on. So just don't use it. Hey, guys, I hate, I, hate, I hate to do this again, but um, i got about 15 minutes to pick up Noah. He gets his braces off today. Yay! Uh, so, Garrett, are you good handling anything as related to links from this point on? I'll do my I'm not sure I'll be able to handle uh, witticisms, but anything link related, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try, Eric. I'll do well, it. All right. Good Just for you. First, you Eric, let's for... see this because he's going to love this. Do not thank silo your digital assets. This is what people do all the time. They create a links and resources section right here, and then they put all their digital assets in one place. Okay. Let's say accidentally you put a bad link in there. Guess what the Google spam team and the Bing spam team does? They can cut off this entire branch just like that. And it happens all the time. So I'm saying if you want to have link assets on a link resources section, you can, but you have to continue to have, I'm going to go back to it, contextual navigation. If you have contextual navigation, you will get rid of the silo problem. So I'm going back to it. So don't just silo. Make sure you have links to your supplemental navigation as well to prevent the siloing effect. So what do I mean by supplemental navigation? A site map, and by site map, I don't mean an XML site map. I mean a Wayfinder site map. The larger your site, the more likely you're going to need a site index instead of a site map. And the golden child of all of this are guides. Guides are linkable assets, and people do love to link to them. Let's look at some good supplemental navigation examples. Here's one that's a guide. Um, 
um, think about, can I eat it? Will it eat me? Can I have sex with it? This is safe, safety. Will it eat me? Parents love guides to helping their children. People who are buying television mounts, they want to know, can I mount my TV on the wall? Can I mount my TV on the ceiling? What kind should I get? Guide to selecting the right wall mount for your TV is a linkable asset. Make these front and center. And what I love about this is they've made the ability to share very easy because they put the links at the top. It doesn't have to be in this format. But it's very easy to share. They do have contextual links, which are fantastic. So they're not siloing. So keep that in mind. The bigger the site, the more you're going to need to use guides. And also, the bigger the site, the more you're going to need a site index. And all this Sorry, is a matter of sorry, I'm sorry to Can, Will you go back? Because I want to make one quick note about this. So sure. top left, look at this. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about um, establishing and demonstrating authority. And we've been here. We've done this before with this type of content on this topic. Um, that top left kind of giving me a sense of depth of diabetes related resources. It's just astounding. This is absolutely, I, I'm going to be much more likely as a linker, much more likely to link to this page, assuming I have a, you know, I have a section on my, on my links and resource page. It's about, uh, that's for parents or that's kid related. This is uh, not only is the title spot on and the content looks great, but then I also have a sense of depth and a sense of these guys are here on this topic, for this topic, this is the real deal publisher. Gosh, I can't believe I never found these guys before. Of course I'm going to add a link. Thank you. Exactly. And just because they don't have a lot of sharing doesn't mean that people don't link to something. Remember, right. social sharing is not a ranking factor. Link no, development is, and it's no, going to continue to it? be. So stuff doesn't get shared. Um, sharing audiences on social media and linking audiences on links and resource pages are very different and have very different um, requirements, uh, content requirements that get them to take action. So I'll say that too. Um, lack of shares, uh, you know, to me, doesn't indicate lack of linkability. Exactly, and this has the green check mark. So this is a to do to your website. Um, so make sure you have guides. And if you have an e-commerce site, guide to selecting is something that's very important to people. So again, make sure you have this. So guides are a gold mine. Um, a site index it can also be a gold mine. And the reason I'm showing you this site is you can actually go to this site and just copy what they've done. They've done an extraordinary job. Look what they've done. They spell out what their abbreviations mean. Everything here looks clickable. ABCs, context, ABCs. What do you think of when you hear ABCs? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They provided context immediately next to it. They provided cross-references. They provided synonyms. And if somebody can't find something, they have a search box that at least allows for 30 characters. And what items are included? Can I suggest a new entry? These are things that help people find things, and these are things that help technology determine the aboutness of your pages. And so site indexes and guides are some of the most overlooked content wayfinders. And if you can add this, you will help get rid of the siloing effect and make your site far more user-friendly and far more better conversions. Tip number five, do not use XML sitemaps, and I use that as one word, as band-aids for information architecture and navigation. Just because Google can access content doesn't mean it understands your content. So you do have to provide document labels, that which are titles and URLs. You have to provide navigation labels, and you have to provide content labels, such as headings and subheadings, to communicate what the content is about. XML sitemaps are supplemental navigation, and they're for technology only. They're not for humans. 
So make sure you have Wayfinder sitemaps as well as XML sitemaps if you need to have an XML sitemap. So here are some helpful links about website navigation. Um, I love this site, wheelie.com. I also like Yahoo's pattern, Yahoo's pattern Library to give you ideas of what things should and should not look like. So, um, you know, unfortunately, Eric had to leave. Um, I wanted to do some key takeaways. Um, would you like to go first, Garrett? What, what would you sure. want people to remember? What are three oh. things you want people to remember? Oh, uh. I think first and foremost is I, I would like uh, my hope is that people got a glimpse of a vision for a more effective way to organize your link uh, linkable assets and I don't mean all of your content not every piece of content that you ever write for your website are you trying to build links to or should it be designed to be to have links built to it um, it should be, certainly be shareable, but not everything is created with a linking audience in mind. But that single slide that Sherry showed, where it, it, it gave it gave the visitor to that page a sense of depth, a uh, sense of depth of topic, of that there's more than one article on this website about type one diabetes. That is a page that a linker is going to hit and say, these guys know what they're talking about without really having to read very much. You're making it easy for them to trust you and to trust your website and to trust that adding a link is going to benefit their visitors. That is, you know, that's, I can't really quite put a nutshell around that, but if I could, that is the, the core kind of takeaway that I, I wanted our, our listeners to this webinar to have, is that the content can't be you know, kind of just thrown out there. It shouldn't be bolted on. It needs to be thought through. Um, ideally, as Sherry mentioned, um, at before your site goes up, right? You're thinking about link, uh, your who who your potential linkers are. You're thinking about your linker valued audiences. Um, who are how do the audiences call themselves? Not just who do what do we call them? Um, they don't call themselves buyers or consumers. Probably um, they 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 may have names for themselves, and we should be uh, respectful of that and, and learn what those are so we can you know better better fit in. Um, I, so I guess that would be kind of a number two is um, if and when possible plan for link building ahead of time. <laughs> I know it's usually the last thing, but if you can do it first. Right? Or when you're designing a website, when you're at the site redesign stage, that's when you start to think about, that's when you do all your research, when you do your prospecting, when you look for who are our link targets, who is linking to our competitors. I really like Derek's idea of the, you know, taking your top 15 and looking at the co-citations and picking the, cherry picking the top, or Apple picking the top 10% from each um, site. Really neat idea. Um, but that's when you, do all this research and do all this work to understand your market, not just your market, but the linking market that exists, who you're trying to create content for. Um, so if I had to, uh, I guess the third takeaway would be, and this was, this is the um, kind of the epiphany for me when I realized that um, Sherry's what Sherry's impact could potentially be on on thinking through, um, uh, you know, how how does linkable content actually how should it live on a website um, is just that URL structure, and we have recognized that we're more likely to get a link from a links and resource uh, page from a curator from a person who maintains that page on the website. Um, you know, gov, edu, libraries, the, the, the authorities out there on the internet, um, we're more likely to get a link when the word blog is not in the URL. And I would have clients ask me, where should we put this document? And I had no clue, <laughs> other than I knew to say, don't necessarily put it on your blog. And this is why we, why I wanted us to have this webinar. Um, and, and why I, I'm so excited to be working with Sherry. Now, that's not necessarily a takeaway, um, but certainly I, I'm just trying to illustrate why this is important, why this um, 
why site navigation and site structure are, are so important, um, why the links on the page, why your why your on-site or internal linking um, approach is so important as well. And, and Sherry used the word curated links quite a bit. And I think that when you're curating the links, the related content links for your um, linkable assets, you're, that's that's going to be at the, a sort of a minimal step forward in thinking through uh, how can we better um, establish authority through usability for our potential linkers. So that's exactly. uh, probably and more than three things, but <laughs> Sherry, what are your my, what are your three? My three things are actually what I intended, what we all intended at the goal of the webinar. You know you have to have content assets on your site, so number one, you do have to plan. Um, if you're doing it as an afterthought, at least you're doing something, and I commend you for that, but in the future, plan. What digital assets do you need? Who do you create them for? Understand why you're creating them. Don't do a YouTube channel if your target audience doesn't use YouTube. Don't do infographics that are huge because the point of an infographic is to make a point quickly and easily. So understand your audience, plan ahead. Number two, where do we place them? We place these links. We definitely put them in contextual and supplemental navigation and do a good job at it. Don't let the software do it for you. Use curation, but if you're using the software development, the stuff the software development first came up with, then at least put them at the end because they're not as important as the contextual links. And finally, when do we place them on a website? Place them once you have everything planned. Know what your URL structure is. Know what your audience likes. Have a calendar when you're going to launch your linkable assets, and above all, make it easy for them to access. So um, I know we went long, and we go along because we want you to get as much information as possible. So I hope we gave you that information. We are making this available, um, Megan. Um, we're going to make this available. Um, when are we going to make this available for everybody? Uh, we're uploading it to our YouTube channel today, and it should be on the Citation Labs blog tomorrow at the latest. So, um, and if you have any questions, at the end it gives us our content information. Please feel free to ask us anything you like, and if we can help you, we will. So um, we're up thank to the hour. Um, Jerry, thank you. This and thank you guys. Fun. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And yeah. Um, again, I hope we ha helped everybody. And if again anybody has any questions, let us know. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Who, who needs to, to I'll end the this? webinar. Thank you all. Okay.